And we welcome you back into this Thursday edition of Sports State. My man right there is Barry Brooks. I'm Derek Gunn. And waiting in the wings to join us right now, he is the senior producer at NFL Films. He is also the executive producer and an analyst for NFL Matchup with a, a friend of ours on this show and a colleague, Sal Palantonio. He is the one and only Greg Cosell. G, welcome in, my brother. How you doing? Gee, I'm just basking in the aria of being with you, D Gunn, and with Barrett Brooks, my man. What's God, going on, bro? How's it going I'm today, man? I'm taking it all in, you know. I don't, I don't know how to feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you look like like you're you're hiding, man? You're like in a closet. I'm looking at that uh, shadow. You know, there you go. Now we can yeah, see. There you go. Well, hold on, hold on. That's the office right there. That, that yeah. everything goes down in that office, man. All yeah, that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in as people like to refer to as the cave, D Gun. You know, where I'm, <laughs> I'm just in here I'm watching college tape right now. You know. Oh, I'm man, doing the same man. thing, man. I'm doing the same thing. Just That's breaking down here. college tape. Man, I tell you what, man. You have had quite the season and off season. Every time I look up and I follow you, obviously on Twitter, and you can follow uh, my man at uh, at Greg Cosell on Twitter. You are on everybody's show. You are on everybody's podcast. I feel like I'm number 10 in the pecking order when I've <laughs> how many different shows you know, got, the things you've been on this off season, man. You no, know, I, I just try to be a nice guy. You know, the problem is, is it's only so many hours in the day and I'm trying to mm-hmm. watch about 250 college guys. Yeah. And, you know, when you watch defensive guys in college, you got to watch full games, you know, as Barrett knows from being here, you know, I, I, I have the coaching tape. So, you know, you have to watch every single play. You can't watch a cornerback for 20 plays and decide what a corner is, you know. Exactly. You've got to watch games. And, yep. you know, college football, they tend to run more plays than they do in the NFL because every, you know, very few teams huddle. So sometimes I'll pull up a game and it's like 92 plays. And uh, the words that come to my mind, I probably won't say now. But, you know, it's just a <laughs> lot of it's a lot of plays you got to watch, you know. Well, obviously, you follow this Eagles team closely like we do. And I guess the first question I have to ask you is your thoughts in a general perspective of what they lost this offseason, what they've added, and what you think they should have added by now? Well, I'll say this. I think that what they lost on defense, because don't forget, we're speaking on March 23rd, okay? Yep. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of time here. Obviously, we live in a in a moment to moment social media world, <laughs> as we all understand. Uh, but my guess is, and and you guys, maybe you can tell me I'm wrong. My guess is this was planned. Now mm-hmm. we'll see what happens next. But they probably have some kind of plan for that too. We just, you know, we don't know what it is, and they're not going to announce it publicly. But you know, I think they knew they were going to lose what they did on defense. I think they knew that um, because you couldn't sign everybody. They, you know, I think, you, you know, we went to bed one night thinking Darius Slay was gone. I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, Darius Slay's back, you know? Right, um, right. So, you know, obviously they still have their two corners. They need to address the safety position. Um, and, you know, obviously linebacker they signed, uh, and now I'm trying to remember who it is that they signed, but they signed – uh, But who? Morrow. Yeah, Morrow, who's, you know, who's been in the league for a long time and has a lot of starts and snaps under his belt. And he's a very athletic guy. So, you know, he'll he'll end up starting, Um, you know, and we'll see where they go. But, uh, you know, I think they knew because they have they have to pay Jalen. They're going to have to pay Devonta Smith at some point here. Um, You know, me. He's going into his third year. He's a first round pick, so technically he has five years. But you know, they normally don't wait. And Devonta mm-hmm. Smith has proven that he needs to get paid. So, you know, I think they understand all this. And my I, I would assume uh that given the success that they've had in these last two years, that people will probably give them the benefit of the doubt. So there's a plan in place. What it is, I guess we'll see as it as it takes mm-hmm. shape. Well, let me ask you this. Um it, do you have a sense on what defensive coordinator uh, Sean Desai is going to run? Is it going to be kind of what they ran last year, or is it going to be more like a, a, a three or four defense you see like in Pittsburgh? Or no. is it going to be something like uh, you're going to see what you know Baltimore runs? What type of three or four do you think they're going to run? Foundationally, Barrett, it'll be from the Fangio school because that's Sean Desai's okay. background. So foundationally, but – you know, that's become like saying the West Coast offense. There's so many variations now 
right. with what teams right. do. As you know, you know, as both you guys know, it's not just one thing. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, I've been fortunate enough to have conversation with coaches who come from the Fangio school, and there's all kinds of variations. Um, you know, the general principle would be that it starts with a split safety look, what would be considered cover four. But when you start with cover four, you can go to anything. That's the thing about cover four that's different than, let's say, single high with a safety in the box. You can pretty much go to anything with cover four. And it'll start there. And there's a lot of zone match principles that that come from that. You know, the, the term that everybody uses in that group is match, carry, deliver. There's a lot of that in that coverage. Um Everybody obviously plays man in this league. You have to line up and play man sometimes. So now it just gets down to the percentages of what they do. Could, will Sean Desai be different in that area than Jonathan Gannon? I'm sure he is. You know, everybody's different. Um, but I think it'll be that'll be the general founding philosophy of what they do. And and that's probably one reason why Desai was hired and why it was between Desai and, and Walker, because I think they wanted to keep the general philosophy uh, you know, of what they've they've done for the last couple of years under Jonathan Gannon. More of an over on the front and then one gap uh, principle. Well, it's that five man. They play a lot of, as you know, that five man front, which has taken over the league. So many mm -hmm. more teams now play that five man front and it's very often reduced. You know, Barrett, you know, being uh, an offensive lineman, you know, you get the one on ones a lot, which a lot of teams yep. are looking for now yep. because in the, when it's a pass rush, you get one on ones, even in the run game when you have that reduced front, it's very hard to run inside. You know, yep. a lot of teams don't run inside zone as much now because it's really hard against those five man mm -hmm. fronts to run inside zone. So you're starting to see a lot more gap scheme in the league where you can down block on those three techniques. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the game evolves, it always evolves in, in multiple <laughs> ways, but you know, that's, I'm pretty sure that's, you know, they signed, they brought Fletcher back, they brought Graham back. Um, obviously they, you know, they, they expect Jordan Davis, I'm sure to take a significant step up both in terms of, of, uh, how well he plays and in terms of number of snaps, uh, Milton Williams has given them good snaps since he's been here. So I would imagine the front won't change dramatically. Mm. Well, Greg, stay with the defense, if you will, for a moment, this team has gone through wholesale changes on defense in terms of coaching staff yep. and, and they lost their top five tacklers, um, to free agency. How long do you think it'll take normally in your, in, in your travels and in your knowledge when you have that kind of changes across the board, how long do you think it will take for the, the, the complete unit to mesh? Because practice time is so limited now. Training camp time is so limited now. It's going to take a lot lo longer than normal, isn't it, for everybody yeah. to be on the same page? That's a great point, D. Gunn, and it will take time, and I think fans yeah. have to accept that. But I think my sense is, again, you know – you know, I'm not having conversations with the front office on a right. regular basis, but my sense is that they view themselves as an offensive football team Yep. and that they can score points. They can score 30 points. So not that they want their defense to be bad. No one you know, wants that. But I think they understand that there'll be growing pains with the defense because, as you mentioned, D-Gun, not, not only do they have a, a new D coordinator, but they're going to have a lot of new players, whoever yeah. they turn out to be. Yeah. You know, my guess is they'll go D-heavy in the draft because they need players. Um, but I think they feel that they can be an offensive team that can be both explosive and sustaining uh, and that they can that, – that will make it easier for, for their defense to be able to – work together quicker because if you can get ahead in games which is i think their plan contrary to what a lot of people may believe they actually threw the ball at a pretty good percentage in the first half of games mm -hmm. and then ran it in the second half they with very few exceptions they did not come out to run the ball they came out to score um yep and then what that does is that ideally puts the opposing offense in a situation where they have to throw and then it puts your defense in a better situation. So I think that's probably the way they see themselves. We all know that how he thinks about this game in terms of you got to score. It's a passing league. you got to score to win. And look, they obviously lost the Super Bowl, but it wasn't because they couldn't score. You know, so I think they see themselves as a team that can be really explosive on offense and that will help the defense acclimate ideally quicker.
Okay. You know, I, I really like, you know, Cam Jurgens, And, you know, what's your assessment on him making that transition into being a guard from being a center his entire career? Is that definitely going to happen? Is that what from what you guys know? It's just speculation. Uh, speculation, yeah. yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Because yeah. they still have Sewell Petter there, Jake mm. Driscoll. You know, they right. still have guys that play the guard position uh, in the wings. But, you know, um, I, I just assume because I, I like him. He's a good player uh, from what I saw at center. Right. You know? But uh, I mean, I mean, you you see you see something different. You they see a guy well, like Sewell Pater or somebody doing. I'm sure you know Jeff Stalin. Maybe maybe he'll tell me I'm an idiot, but I'm not sure that you know just from when I studied him coming out of Nebraska. And don't forget, he was a converted tight end. He can't mm-hmm. really get a whole lot bigger. He doesn't have a yeah. lot more body, Barrett, to get bigger. You right, know? right. So you know, I I don't know the answer to that. Like I said. You know, I would defer to people that know a lot more about offensive line play than I do, but I think that is a a a, a work in progress. I don't want to say it's a question because maybe they feel really good about it, and you know, when I'm wrong, I just think they're five. They're five best on the field. And I think he's one of the best five, and and know. that's probably fair at yeah. this moment in time, unless they draft someone. You mm-hmm. know, um, and 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 they could well do that. I think they probably will draft offense and offensive lineman along the way that doesn't mean it's going to happen you know at pick 10 or at pick 30 or who knows but you know as you know barrett you can draft offensive linemen in the third round who can come in and be really good players for you mm-hmm. yeah. so i think that would be considered a work in progress because he's not going to get up to 320 or 325 no. now again i'm not saying you have to be that but he's that's not going to happen Greg, how do you think this this Jalen Hurts contract thing plays itself out? Now, obviously, the Eagles have one more year on this rookie deal. I mean, you, you, Howie Roseman loves to get deals done yep. uh, before rookie contracts are up. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo got his number. Derek Carr got his number. And Howie Roseman is not shy about paying players in any position that they identify they want to keep. Obviously, Jalen has shown in just one season that he is one of the best of the best in the game. How do you think the scenario plays it out? Do you think they string it out, or do you think how he wants to get it done sooner rather than later? I would think they'd want to get it done sooner than later. The question is, you know, becomes Jalen and his agent group, you know, because now we're, we're in that mode where, you know, quarterbacks are going to ask for fully guaranteed contracts at yeah. really high numbers. Uh, I, my sense is that's not going to happen. You know, the fully guaranteed part, he might get the biggest number, but I don't think the, I don't think it would be fully guaranteed. Um, so now it all comes down to, you know, that the negotiation, I don't follow that kind of stuff super closely. They're not going to let him walk. I don't think he's going to sit out. So I think they'll get it done. Um, you know, obviously in a different way than other teams, this offense does run through Jalen because mm-hmm. of what he gives you in the run game. See, in the run game, he dictates how defenses have to play. And that gives you so much with the full context of your offense. It allows them to be really efficient in the pass game without having a huge playbook in the pass game because they know what they're going to get from defenses. And, and that's why I think that the Rashad Penny move was a really, really good move because the bottom line is it's a schemed run game. It's not a run game like you think of Tennessee where, you know, mm-hmm. let's just give it to the big back. It's a schemed run game. And Penny is a big back with power and the ability to really take it to the house. If he can stay healthy, and we all know that's an if, but two years ago, those last five, six, seven games of the season, he was as good a back as there was in the league. Mm-hmm. Um and if he can stay healthy, you know, he's he really gets he ultimately is better for this offense than Miles Davis. Uh, Miles Davis, wow, than Miles <laughs> the great um, musician. Miles I, li- Davis. I, listen to, I listen to music when I watch tapes sometimes, you know, and, and all different kinds of music. So, you know, I guess I had Miles Davis on my mind, you know. Um, but he, you know, he's ultimately a better back for this offense than Miles Sanders. And I have tremendous respect for Miles Sanders. Yeah. I thought he's had a terrific season. I thought the last two years he showed increased toughness running inside. Um, yeah, he did. Yep. But, but I think that that uh, Penny is just he's pu- more purely explosive in terms of taking it to the house. And because it's so scheme, I mean, just look at the NFC Championship game against. San Francisco, a great defense. And you guys probably remember that touchdown drive, I believe, that put him ahead 14-7 in the second quarter, where the Gainwell 17-yard run and the Sanders 13-yard touchdown were the exact same play. And the way – 
that's a schemed play. They ended up with three on three to the weak side because of the formation and because of how a defense has to react to that because they essentially showed four strong and the defense has to react to that in a certain way because of the Hertz factor. So the Hertz factor is so critical to their run game, which is why it's so highly schemed. Well, you know, you look at it um, offensively, defensively, and what they've added to this team. How do you think you still think they're um, stacked above everybody in the division? And where do you think they stack as far as being in the uh, conference? Well, offensively, they'll be really good. Even if the right guards are work in progress, whoever it is, they're still going to be really, really good offensively. I mean, the quarterback's really good. Their running game, I think Gainwell is, is – we saw what he could do in the last five, six weeks of the season. Um, you know, I think their running back situation is really strong. Uh, we know about Brown and, um, and Devonta Smith. I mean, Devonta Smith, I, I love watching him play. He's such a – a good route runner and, and AJ Brown. Great route runner. Yeah. Yeah. AJ Brown's very good. And and Dallas Goddard's a top three, four tight end in this league. People yes. don't talk about him. You know, we got hurt and missed those what four or five games, but he mm -hmm. is a top three, four tight end in this league. Um, you know, even with the, the right guard position being a work in progress, their O line is still really, really good. I mean, Barrett, it's amazing to me. Jason Kelsey, I feel like he's getting better with each season. You know, and and how you do that as he keep, as he gets older, I don't know how you do that. You know, but he's exactly. just really getting better with each season. Um, and they're you know, so they're really good on offense. So defensively is what we just don't have answers to as we speak today. You know, new mm -hmm. coordinator. There'll be a lot of new pieces. Um, I think it's really good that they kept their two corners. Um, you know, obviously they still have Sweat. They still have Reddick. Um, you know, they signed Graham and Cox, who are more rotational players at this yep. point. You know, I think Jordan Davis is, is is a big key to this. And if you're being honest, we just don't know. Greg, I want to go back to uh, Jalen Hurst for just a moment, because Barrett and Rob and I have agreed to disagree about his usage in the run game um, in a lot of ways. I don't like seeing my quarterback running a football 17 times right. in, in a game. Um as strong as he am, he is, he as he is, he has all the attributes to be a quarterback, but he has that exceptional ability with that leg strength to be a running back. But we saw him get nicked up a couple of times, and we saw throughout the careers, the brief careers of an RG three, and we saw what happened to Lamar Jackson last season. The more you run, the more you put yourself in harm's way. Yep. What's a what's a good number for a quarterback like a Jalen Hurts? When you if you're going to take off and run because too 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 many times for me he's got double digits when it comes to carries. Yeah, it's D Gun. It's a really difficult balancing act for yeah. this reason. It's that the the running element that he brings dictates what defenses do and yeah. allows you to do things on offense that are really good. So it's it's really a difficult balancing act. I don't think there's a number. Um, you know, don't forget some of the runs also come from the fact that he can scramble. And yeah. when you when, when quarterbacks that can scramble see space, they go. And, you know, I remember Dick Vermeil used to come in when, when, when Jaws was here all the time. You know, uh, he hasn't been on matchup for a number of years. But when he was on the matchup show, Dick Vermeil would come in. And, you know, he said something that is so true. He said running quarterbacks run because they can. You know, and that's, that's true, you know, and Jalen, I wouldn't call him a running quarterback in a strict sense. Right. Uh, but, you know, if he sees space, you know, he's going to go. And and guys like that, you know, it's like Josh Allen, too. You know, they're so confident in their ability. They don't think about getting hurt, you know, and, and you know, Barrett could speak to this better than you and I, Deagon, because we yeah. weren't out there playing. Right. I don't think guys go out there thinking about getting hurt. I think nope. you play ball. And it is what it is. Everybody accepts in, in this business that people do get hurt, but no one goes out there with the idea of, hey, I could get hurt today. You just go out and you play ball. It's just right there. Am I right? It's part of you're the You're absolutely deal. right. Yep. I mean, you, if you, play, you play scared, then, you know, you, you're not playing. You right. Know, so. so, you know, it's that's why it's such a tough, you know, their run game is is very, very dependent on what on the Hurts factor which doesn't mean him as a runner, but the fact that defenses have to deal with that and how they structure their defense. So if they give Jalen the opportunity to run based on what he sees, mm -hmm. you can't say to him, don't run it. 
you know, because then you're taking away some really important things that your offense can do. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, abstractly, I agree with you, D-Gun, but mm -hmm. I, I, they're not going to coach it that way. No. They're not going to go into the season saying, you know what, we really don't want Jalen to run the football. You know, they might – as, as the offense can now expand because Jalen's in it for another year. And, you know, obviously, even though the coordinator's gone, um, Brian Johnson's still here and he's the coordinator. So it, they're going to be doing a lot of the same things because it's Nick's offense probably for the most part. Mm -hmm. They can expand the offense in some ways now that maybe they don't have to run them quite as much. But yep. like I said, they're not going to say to them, don't run if, if you see it. You got to keep that threat, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, let me ask this, Greg. You got to put your Howie hat on. <laughs> my, my investment portfolio is not big enough for that. <laughs> All right, 10. Do we stay at 10? And if we do stay at 10, what is the biggest? Well, I know they don't draft by need, but what do you think they will pick Well, at, at pick number 10? Here's the way I see it. I think that they probably have one or two guys that they're going to really pinpoint. And I think if those guys are gone, they're going to trade out. Mm -hmm. because you know mm -hmm. how he does that and just yep. to get more yep. picks if if not i really think that they would want to fortify their d line um you could argue you never have enough corners because don't forget um even though slay and bradbury are back and i know bradbury signed a three-year deal and slay i think it was a two-year extension is that correct correct they're still older players you know, and yeah. now you get into, do they miss some time because of injury? You don't know. So you in this league, as you guys know, you never have enough corners. So, uh, you know, I think they probably based, and, and they're still, what, uh, almost five weeks to go until the mm -hmm. draft. But they'll know who they want at corner based on their, their study. You know, and, and if they feel really strongly about a guy and he's there, my guess is they would take him. If they feel really strongly about a defensive lineman, I think they would take him. But if those guys are gone, I would sense that they would might trade out, mm. you know, um, and just try to get more picks. Greg, um, a lot of people in this region are screaming for the Eagles to take B. John Robinson, the, the running back out of That's Texas. That's not going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's where I'm going because I was told last week they're not going to take a running back in the first round, okay? But people are screaming, put him in that backfield, makes it a complete backfield. I just don't see the Eagles taking a running back. I don't care who it well, is. Well, they're not going to take a running back at 10. I'm, I'm no, not, not going to say they wouldn't take one at 30 or in the second round, but they're not going to take him at 10. We know right. that. Do you think it's a possibility of 30 if they stuck at 30? If he was there? Yeah. Um, well, this may be this may be a controversial statement to some, but I would I would think that if if he was there and Jamar Gibbs was there, I think they'd have a a tough decision. Because yes. with the way they play offense, Jameer Gibbs, you know, is is a really is a really good pick. You know, last summer I watched Jameer Gibbs when he was at Georgia Tech. Okay. I didn't know anything about him. You know, he was at Georgia Tech. They weren't a very good football team. Um, and I'm watching this guy on tape and it happened to be the same day that Fred Taylor, Ryan Clark and Shannon Crowder were in our building. And um, they brought him by my office because they knew, you know, I watch tape and they're football guys and I'm watching Jameer Gibbs. And I got into a great conversation with Fred Taylor, who was to me, one of the great running backs who it's a shame you know, he got hurt yep. a little bit because he was unbelievable. Florida uh, went to Florida and then went, you yeah. know, but, um, and I said to him, I said, you know, this Jameer Gibbs, he didn't, you know, he heard of him, but he didn't know anything about him. I said, you mark my words, this kid's going to be a first round pick, you know, because I, I think he'd already transferred to Alabama because um, I was watching him last summer and, you know, he is really explosive and because he can catch the ball and because he can line up anywhere in the formation, you know, the big question with Robinson, Bijan Robinson, and I love Bijan Robinson. I, I think yeah. he's clearly the best back in the draft. If you're just, you know, as a running back, the question is, does he need to be a volume runner in mm. order to be really effective? I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't think the Eagles run their offense that way. So, you know, yes, is he a really good prospect? Absolutely. But the Eagles are not taking him at 10. Okay. All right. Dude, D Gun, you agree with that, right? Oh, I agree 100%. There's no way they take a running back at, at, at number 10. But yeah. people I are don't saying, think well, third either. 
Yeah, see, I don't either. I don't yeah, see I them taking a running back. If they if they keep those two first round picks, I don't see them coming close to taking a running back. But you know what people are saying? If you don't take Bijan and Dallas takes him, we're going to lose our minds. Because, you know, Jerry Jones might do something like that in the middle to later parts of a round to replace Zeke is take a Bijan Robinson. Kids I from think they Texas pick around. Story, right. Where do they pick? I think they pick right around 26 or something. Yeah, but you know like what? That. I don't know yeah. when. You can't make your picks based on that. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you can't um, make make your picks based on – look, they signed Penny. I know it's a one-year deal, but, yeah, 26. you know, I think they feel – I would think they feel pretty good with Penny Gainwell and Scott right now. And yeah. and by the way, I have no idea what, what their feeling is about Trey Sermon, who actually had a terrific final season at Ohio State. Yeah. I don't know what happened in San Francisco. I've heard good things. You know, obviously he was a healthy scratch pretty much every week but one. But he's got a lot of ability too. So I don't think they see running back as an immediate need right now. Right. I don't think they're going to take a running back with a high pick. Well, I mean, to me, their immediate need – Right now, with with Kayvon Wallace and you know Reed Blankenship as the start of safeties, I, I think agree. That's, that's but there isn't one, one the to take it ten. Team. There isn't one to take it ten, which is no. why uh, they could trade back. It's not a great safety class this year. No, I think the kid from Alabama is probably the best you got going. Yeah, but, but he's I almost more of a slot corner slash right. safety. So right. I right. don't know if they would take him because they signed Avante a, a year or so ago to a deal. He's a good slot corner. You know, they're not yep. looking to replace him. You think they could put him in safety, though? I think I, I, I'm i on the lines of putting it, Maddox in safety, yes. And play that hybrid branch in safety because he's played it. Mm. Um, so we'll see. But, no, you're right. Safety is a position they need to address for sure. Um, we'll see. You know, that's what the draft is for. Can't wait. Hey. Hey, Greg, I want to ask you about a couple of things around the league uh, that are going on. Let's start with this Aaron Rodgers drama. Uh, your thoughts on the way he's holding two teams hostage and how, ah. how it plays itself out. I mean, this, this is one of the most ridiculous things ever. You hear the stories that he's requested from the Jets to get certain players to go out and get his boy, Alan Lazar from Green Bay. a says, I never asked him to get anything. You know, Green Bay wants to save face. When you think about the deal Seattle got for Russell Wilson going to Denver, Four, five draft picks, four That's players. That's not going to happen here. That's Okay, so how do you see that? What do you think is a feasible move on the part of the Packers to well, to give, give Rodgers to the Jets with their blessing? Yeah. I would defer to my friend Joe Banner here who says that basically because he knows the cap stuff, and I don't, sure. that the Packers are really the team that has the problem here yeah. because they're going to owe him all kinds of money, mm -hmm. and, and they've kind of made it clear that he's gone – so, you know, everybody assumes the Jets have to make this deal tomorrow. I mean, obviously the Jets want to know who their quarterback is, but yeah. the Packers are the team that's liable for a boatload of money here. And they're so, going to pay, they're gonna have to pay some of that contract before he even goes to the Jets, right? Right, right. So, you know, look, the Jets, the Jets have a good football team. They had a good football team last year. They just had really spotty quarterback play. And obviously Brees Hall will be back. You know, he hurt, got hurt last year with the ACL. He'll yep. be back. Um you know, Garrett Wilson is a really good receiver. You know, they did sign Lazard. He's a, he's a nice compliment. Um, you know, they just got Miko Hardman, who's a certain kind of player. They wanted a vertical dimension. He's not a volume target, but they want a vertical dimension because uh, it changes the way defenses play. Um, so they're a good football team. Um, they certainly like to get their quarterback situation settled. But, you know, I think they understand that the Packers are really the team that from what I understand anyway, they're the team that needs to, to get this done because they've kind of moved on. And if Aaron Rodgers is not traded, you know, they're, that's a weird situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's bring it back to the division. Um, Eric Bieniemy is now the mastermind yep. behind Washington's offense. How much better can he make that Washington offense when you look at the collection of pass catchers and weapons he has at his disposal? Well, I think in an ideal world, they would mm -hmm. like to start with the run game because, you know, the quarterback situation, um, you know, I think they would love to see Sam Howell be the quarterback. Yeah. Um, they were really happy with the way he developed in his rookie season. You know, obviously he didn't play except for that last game when he actually played pretty well. Um, and I think they'd like to have a strong run game because Brian Robinson is that kind of best. See, he's a volume runner. 
Mm-hmm. You know, he's not going to break 60 yard runs. They'd like to be in a situation where, you know, 17 to 22 carries a game, run the ball, work off that. The play action pass game, take some shot plays with with some good receivers that can get down the field in both uh, McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. Um, you know, that's what they'd like their offense to be. Um, you know, my guess is the enemy was brought in because he can put together a really good run game as one of his strengths. Um, and I think that's what they'd like to do, you know, how it plays out. You know, if you're going to play like that, you need your defense to be good as well, because mm. you can't you can't play like that and and have, you know, all of a sudden be down 17 three in the second quarter of games. So, you know, but I think ultimately that's what they would want. That remains to be seen. OK, uh, the Giants had Paris Campbell, a wide receiver, yep. not one of the so-called big names in the open market. But Brian Dabo came out and said, we need – and they're bringing back Slayton. They're, they're, they're bringing back um, Shepard also. Brian Dabo said, we need receivers that can get an open space in a hurry. Yeah. So so the first year Brian Dabo had to go with what he inherited. Now you're starting to see him put his own niche. Does the Paris Campbell – and that much more to that offense, and of course, Daniel Jones gets his nice contract. Yeah. Do you expect that? Do you expect the Giants' offense to be that much better this year? Well, I expect Daniel Jones to continue to get better in okay. the same uh, offense that he was in mm-hmm. last year. Um, you know, I think Paris Campbell, his problem has always been durability; he gets injured. But Paris Campbell's been, a, as a player, number one, he's big. So he's an interesting combination of being able to take short passes and run after catch and having vertical ability. So he is a guy, if you do get the ball in space, look, many might remember him at Ohio State. He caught a ton of those shallow crosses and just turned them upfield for big plays. He has that kind of ability. The the problem is he hasn't been able to stay on the field. Mm. Now, so they're taking a chance with him, clearly, uh, because of the durability issue. But, you know, again, that's what you have to do. He's still a relatively young player, and he does have that kind of ability. And finally, what do you make of Mike McCarthy now calling the plays down in Dallas? Everybody in the outside looking in is laughing at the fact that, well, Dallas is going to have another losing season if Mike McCarthy's (laughs) calling the plays. (laughs) You know, I don't really know what to make of that. I mean, I think that – I think they'd like to run the ball more, you know – it's funny. Everybody talks about backs being devalued and the run game not being important until the run game is important. You know, it's yeah, one of those. Yeah. It's not important until it is important. You know, and and if you can't run it or you feel like you can't run it, it changes the way you play, and you, you become easier to defend. Um, so you know, no one ever suggests that. Oh no, you have to have a back carry twenty five times a game. We know that that's not going to happen. <clears throat> but I think that Mike McCarthy would like to run it more. Um, and we'll see how that that works out. You know, it's obviously they Tony Pollard is there. I don't think he's a volume runner, um, so they do need another back. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned B. John Robinson. I'm not sure they would want to do that for the reason that I'm not. Yeah, you know, I, I I think he's a volume runner, and and, and with Pollard there, yeah, I'm just not sure how that would work because yeah, be by committee with how with, with Pollard. Yeah, Pollard in, yeah. needs touches which doesn't like i said he's not going to get 20 carries a game but you don't want to be in a situation where all of a sudden pollard's getting eight touches a game i mean pollard Mm -hmm. is an explosive player right um, and you know you you want him to be a significant part of your offense appreciate you man definitely appreciate you yeah my final question to you because i know i I don't want to think because i know you got the wheels spinning and the tapes rolling my final question to you is this as we sit here today and we look at all the moves that have been made around the NFL and more importantly, the NFC, which team is the biggest obstacle to the Eagles if on the Eagles mission of trying to get back to the Super Bowl in the NFC? I mean, the team that I, I think I'm most curious about are the Giants. Okay. Because I think that their, uh, their coaching staff is really good. You know, Wink Martindale is their defensive coordinator. Um, I thought they made a great signing with Bobby Okereke, who's a really good linebacker. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, second year, I think they're going to be better on both sides of the ball. Whatever that means, one lost record, you know, who can answer that on March 23rd? Sure. But, but, you know, I think that they're really a a well-coached, well-structured team. You know, Daniel Jones, for a couple years, everybody laughed at him. He's, you know, 
he's not an A level quarterback, but he's a solid NFL quarterback that you can line up and play with. He's a smart guy. Yeah. He's going to be better in his second season under Brian Dable. They'll have better weapons. You know, I think I think they're to me, they're the most intriguing team as we sit here today. All right. All right. That'll do it. Uh, Greg, I can't thank you enough for uh, giving us a few minutes of your valuable time. And I know how valuable your time is. He is a senior producer at NFL Films, executive producer of an analyst of the NFL matchup with our friend and colleague, Sal Palantonio. Follow him at Greg Cosell on Twitter. G, hopefully we can get you back on the show after the draft and throughout the summer and talk some more football, my friend. I appreciate you taking appreciate time you, to Greg. hop on with us, man. G. Gunn Barrett, really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. All right, brother. You have a great day and a have great a weekend. Bro. All right, uh, we're going to step aside for uh, a moment. When we come back, we're going to pick up the Eagles talk again because, as I promised Mr. Brooks, I have a few more potential for, uh, veteran free agent running backs I want to ask him about. Would they be a fit? Also want to look at the safety position. I got a list of six or seven names at the safety position to see if it piques Barrett's interest. Of course, coming up at 2 o'clock, as I said, Derek Bogner to talk about the 76ers. Joel Embiid, and, and how do you load manage him and, and take a look at the 76ers' last nine games, which are all against uh, potential playoff teams. He's Barrett Brooks. I'm Derek Gunn. This is the Thursday edition of Sports Take. We'll be right back after this pause for the cause. <laughs> 